Hello, everyone. How are you? Today, we are going to discuss the Coriolis force and motion of Earth. Coriolis force is very important force, which is experienced on Earth. We are going to see the Coriolis force and uh, its effect on the motion of Earth. Uh, let us come to the first slide. Uh, we have to discuss first the moving coordinate system. Many times the solution of the problem can be achieved by considering moving coordinate system. Generally, the two frames are considered. One is fixed in the laboratory and the second one is fixed on moving system. The laboratory frame can be called as the fixed frame, while a moving frame of reference can possess either translational or rotational velocity with respect to the frame moving frame of fixed frame of reference. Sometimes the moving frame of reference can have uh, both translational and rotational velocities with respect to the fixed frame of reference. A frame of reference moving with constant velocity relative to fixed frame is called inertial frame of reference. If the frame of reference is accelerated, relative to the fixed frame, it is called the known inertial frame of reference. So rotational motion is always an accelerated motion. Therefore, all frame of references that are rotating relative to the fixed frame of reference are known inertial frame of references. The motion of particle moving on Earth is usually described with reference to a frame, fixed frame on the surface on the earth or center of earth. And that is the example of known inertial frame of reference because earth is having a rotational motion. Now we consider the coordinate system that is having a translational motion with relative to the fixed frame of reference. In this figure, we try to see the two coordinate system or two frames. One is represented, that is the moving one, represented as X, Y, Z having origin at O. And another one is uh, the fixed frame that is having origin O prime, and that is having a coordinate axis X prime, Y prime, and Z prime. And the point P is represented with the vectorial distance r in a moving frame and vectorial distance r prime in a fixed frame. And the distance between the two origin is represented by capital R. And uh, in the derivation, the bold face shows the vectors or vectorial representation. So uh, equation number one shows the vector r prime, which is shown in figure, is equal to the vectorial sum of capital R plus small r. So that is equation number one. That is R prime is equal to capital R plus small r. Now taking a differentiation with respect to time. So that shows R dot prime is equal to capital R dot plus R dot. And if we take one more derivative that shows the acceleration. So it is R double dot prime is equal to capital R double dot plus small r double dot, that is equation number three. So equation of motion of the particle at point P in the fixed system can be represented as m r double dot prime is equal to f. So if we consider only the fixed system that is only having a prime, so it is uh, represented force acting is f is equal to m r double dot. So here F is the total external force acting on the particle at point P. Now equation of motion for the moving frame is given by multiplying equation number three by masses. So equation number three, it is only multiplied by mass. So MR double dot prime is equal to MR capital double dot, then MR small r double dot. And if we try to rearrange it, so it is MR double dot is equal to F, and that is represented by MR double dot prime minus MR double dot capital R. 
So this is just rearranging equation. And uh, we know that MR double dot can be represented as F effective because F effective is represented by F minus M capital R double dot. So if moving frame of reference has acceleration d by dt r double dot or r double dot, and the effective force acting on the particle at point P is smaller by m d by dt r dot or m r double dot, capital R double dot. So this reduction in the force, which is represented over here in equation number four, f minus m r double dot, that is capital R. When d by dt r dot is equal to zero, the equation of motion is identical in the two system. So if we consider that m r capital double dot, that is zero, then both equations are same, both forces are same, both forces are identical. So Newton's law of motion are valid in the two systems moving with uniform relative velocity. This is known as a principle of Newtonian relativity or Galilean invariance. The form of equation remains the same in the two systems. This is expressed by considering that the equation are covariant with respect to uniform translation of the coordinate system. Such accelerated coordinate systems are called the inertial frame of reference. There is a difference in the meaning of coordinate system and frame of reference. In changing the coordinate system, the changes from one system to another do not involve time. And in the other system, but the changes in the frame of reference includes the change in time. So in a frame of reference, the changes are involved having a time. And in the coordinate system, from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, time is not involved. So there is a difference between the two. If we are using the moving frame of reference, the term occurs in the equation of motion due to the acceleration of the frame. If we want to achieve the same form of equation of motion, we have to add term m d by dt capital R dot or M R double dot on the right hand side. So let us go back to equation four. So in this equation, M R double dot is equal to F minus M capital R double dot. So if we add in this equation plus M R double dot, so plus M R capital double dot. So minus M R double dot plus M R double dot cancels out and we have both the equations same. So this additional term does not represent a real force and it is called the fictitious or pseudo or non-inertial force. The real force, the real force exists due to certain kind of field of force or interaction and depends upon the position and motion of other bodies. The non-inertial force has existence only in moving frame of reference. For example, centrifugal force, which is experienced by turning cars suddenly. And we have shown here the two pictures. A car is moving uh, very fast and having a turn. Then the centrifugal force is experienced. Even in the merry-go-round, whenever it moves, then the centrifugal force is experienced then these are the examples of pseudo forces. Now we come to another mathematical derivation part that is the rotating coordinate system. In earlier part, we have not considered the rotating coordinate system, but here we are considering the rotating coordinate system. Now we are having a two different type of coordinate system having the same origin. And we try to show that, that uh, the black uh, with the black color, it is shown that x prime, y prime, z prime. And the unit vectors are represented by i prime, k prime, and j prime. And the red one is the rotating one, and that is represented by x, y, and z. And their unit vectors are shown by 
I, J, K. And both are having a same origin. And point P is represented by a vector R. So point P is some point, and that is having a position vector R. So the position vector R can be written as follows for both fixed and rotating coordinate system. So R prime is equal to I prime, X prime, J prime, Y prime, plus K prime, Z prime. So that is in a prime system. The same thing can be represented in the known prime system, that is the rotating system. It is R equal to I, X, plus J, Y, plus K, Z. And that is represented as equation number six. The transformation equations from unprime to prime one system can be obtained by taking a dot product of vector R with unit vectors I prime, J prime, and K prime. So we are taking a dot product. So we want to have a transformation from prime to unprime one. So the following equations, equation number seven, that shows the left-hand side x prime, y prime, and z prime. So these are represented as x prime, y prime, and z prime. And these are x prime, y prime, z prime. And they represent the prime uh, coordinate system. On the right-hand side, x, y, and z, these are the unprime one. So we have x prime represented as r dot i prime is equal to i dot i prime x, plus j dot i prime y plus k dot i prime z. So these are having the x, y, and z. So right-hand side terms are having unprime terms. Left-hand side terms are having prime terms. And the dot product shows the cosine of angles between the corresponding axes. So they represent the cosine angles. Now the reverse transformation can be possible. In reverse transformation, just wherever there is a prime time, we write non-prime times. And wherever the non-prime times are there, we write the prime times, prime terms we write. So wherever we have a prime terms, we write non-prime terms. Wherever we are having a prime terms, we write non-prime terms. And like that, we can write an inverse transformation. So the equation for the inverse transformation can be similarly written down taking a dot product of R with unit vectors I, J, K. And we can have an inverse transformation. For vector V is equal to V, function of T is represented as follows for unprimed and prime system. So V is equal to I, V, X plus J, V, Y plus K, V, Z. And V is represented as I prime V prime X plus J prime V prime Y plus K prime V prime Z. And that is represented as equation eight. Vector V remains same. Only the presentation is different in the prime system and unprime system. So we take a time derivative of vector V. So it is dV by dt. The effect system can be represented as I prime V dot prime x plus j prime b dot prime y plus k prime b dot prime z. And that is equation number nine. In the unprime system, the unit vectors are changing because that is a moving system or rotating system. And the vectors are changing in directions and their derivatives will appear as, well, as follows. So we take a dv by dt. So first we take a derivative with the vectorial component. So it is i v dot x plus j v dot y plus k v dot z. Then in the second term, we are having a derivative with unit vectors. So di by dt, but vx fixed. Then dj by dt, vy plus dk by dt, vz. And that is represented as equation number 10. So the first three terms of equation number 10 uh, on the right hand side are the time derivatives of the vectors in rotating system when the unit vectors i, j, and k are treated as constant vectors. And for the other three terms, the derivatives of unit vectors are taken. And these are represented as v dv by dt rotation i v dot x 
plus j v dot y plus k v dot z and that is represented as v dot r so this is the velocity of the rotating system and the other three terms are represented by equation number three are due to the result of the rotation of the system so the linear velocity of particle having a position vector r and rotating with angular velocity omega from the same origin can be represented as v that's a vector dr by dt linear velocity is equal to omega cross r this is the angular velocity r is the vector so there's a relation between the linear velocity and rotational velocity that is represented by equation number 12. in equation number 10 this above equation the last three terms where the unit vectors i j and k are rotating with angular velocity omega can be represented by using equation number 12. so di by dt is equal to omega cross i dj by dt equal to omega cross j dk by dt is equal to omega cross k and that is shown by equation number 13. now using equation number 13 in equation number 10 dv by dt fix can be represented first three terms represents the rotational one so dv by dt rotation plus the three terms representing omega cross i plus omega cross j plus omega cross k and that can be represented as dv by dt rotation plus omega cross v and that is equation number 14. now equation number 14 can be treated as an operator equation and which gives relation between the time derivative in fixed and the rotating coordinate system so this can be in general written as follows so d by dt fix equal to d by dt rotation and plus omega cross blank so we have to select the vector now this operator can act on any operator so if we write v then it is dv by dt equal to dv by dt rotation plus omega cross v if we write for r then it is dr by dt fix equal to dr by dt rotation plus omega cross r so we have to write the uh, operate uh, vector in this particular operator now let us consider that the operator given by equation number 15 acts on omega that is angular velocity so d omega by dt fix is equal to d omega by dt rotation plus omega cross omega now we know that the cross product omega cross omega is zero so d omega by dt plus zero so it is d omega by dt rotation so d omega by dt fix is equal to d omega by dt rotation and that is equal to omega dot so this means that the angular acceleration is same in the fixed and the rotating system so angular rotation does not change angular acceleration does not change in fixed as well as in rotating system simplifying the notations now d by dt fix can be represented as d prime by dt prime and uh, d by dt rotation can be represented by simple d by dt in equation number uh, 17. now taking the second derivative of v so d to v by dt square it is represented by d by dt prime d by dv by dt prime and uh, d by, dv by dt prime can be represented by using equation 15 so it is dv by dt plus omega cross v and that is again operated by d prime by dt so d prime by, by dt prime that can be represented again by dv by dt plus omega cross the second bracket so this can be simplified then in a form that is d2v by dt square is equal to d2v by dt square plus d omega by dt cross omega cross v plus omega cross dv by dt plus omega cross the bracket term if you open the bracket term and simplify we can find out that it is d2v by dt square and uh, plus d omega by dt cross v plus omega cross dv by dt 
plus omega cross dv by dt. So that term happens in a two times. Plus last term is omega cross omega cross v. This can be further written d2v by dt square is equal to d2v by dt square plus d2 omega cross dv by dt plus omega cross omega cross v d omega by dt cross v. That is equation number 18. Now, this can be used to obtain expression for velocity and acceleration of a particle situated at point P. Considering a general case in which the origin O of the rotating coordinate system is also moving with respect to O prime. So O prime is a fixed one and O is representing origin of a moving system. So both origins are not located at the same place. In that case, using the following equation, uh, we have written that r prime is equal to r plus small r and taking a derivative it is d r prime by dt fix d r by dt fix plus d r by dt fix and using for r in equation number 19 so using equation number 14 for r because we have already seen that equation number 14 that is written for v. Now, in place of v, we are writing for r. So it is dr prime by dt fix is equal to d capital R by dt fix plus dr by dt rotation plus omega cross r. And we call it as equation number 20. Now, again, using equation number 18, that is again shown in a blue box above. So using that equation in this equation number 20, we can write d2r prime by dt square fix is equal to d2 capital R by dt square fix plus d2r by dt square rotation plus 2 omega cross dr by dt rotation plus omega cross omega cross r plus d omega by dt cross r. That is equation number 20. So we have used equation number 20 and equation number 18 to obtain this equation. Equation number 20 can be put in a more compact form by putting F for fixed and R for rotation and derivatives by usual dot form. So instead of writing fix or rotation, just we put F and R. So it can be represented same equation, R dot prime F, plus capital R dot F plus R dot R plus omega cross R. And the second equation is R double dot prime F plus capital R double dot F plus R double dot R plus two omega cross R dot R plus omega cross omega cross R plus omega dot cross R. Now each term represents something. So even equation number 20 prime, the last term shows the velocity due to the rotation of the axis. In equation number 21 prime, the middle term shows that is two omega r dot r, that is the Coriolis acceleration. The term representing omega cross omega cross r shows the centripetal acceleration. And the last term, is showing that is omega dot r angular acceleration of the particle due to the acceleration of the rotating axis. Now each term is representing over here r dot prime f and r double dot prime f that is the velocity and acceleration relative to the fixed axis because prime shows the fixed axis. Capital R dot f capital R double dot F, those are showing, showing linear velocity and acceleration of the origin of the rotating system. And R dot R, R double dot R, the velocity and acceleration relative to the rotating axis because unprimed terms shows the uh, rotating system. And omega is the angular velocity of the rotating axis.
Now the centripetal means towards the center acceleration of the particle situated at point P is directed to the axis of the rotation and it is perpendicular to it. It has the following magnitude. So if you write omega cross omega cross R, and that can be represented with the full magnitude omega square r sine theta. And where v is equal to omega r sine theta, that is equal to the speed of particle when it rotates in a circle of radius r sine theta. By using that, we can write is equal to v square divided by r sine theta. That is represented by equation number 22. The Coriolis acceleration is present only when the particle has a velocity r dot in the rotating frame. In rotating frame, a particle is not moving, means r dot velocity is zero, then Coriolis acceleration is not present. The Coriolis acceleration is present only the particle is having a velocity or it moves. If it does not move, then Coriolis acceleration is not present. The whole thing can be represented in this figure. In this figure, omega represents the angular velocity. Omega cross omega cross r, that is towards the centripetal acceleration. And this is represented by omega cross r. So omega, omega cross r, omega cross omega cross r, all three are mutually perpendicular to each other. And r shows the position vector of the point P and theta is the angle. Now we come to the Coriolis force, which is uh, already derived right now. The Newton's second law of motion shows F is equal to MA valid only in the inertial frame of reference. So F is equal to M d2R by dt square fixed. That is equation number 23. The differentiation carried out with respect to the fixed system, because here, it is valid only for the fixed system. Let the angular velocity of the rotating system be constant, then d omega by dt is equal to zero. And the origin of the fixed and rotating systems, they coincide, since capital R is equal to zero, and R prime is equal to R. So in that case, the equation number 21 can be rewritten. So the equation 21, we have already mentioned this equation number 21 can be rewritten. It is m d 2 r by dt square rotation is equal to m d 2 r by dt square minus 2 m omega cross dr by dt minus m omega cross omega cross r. And we call it as equation number 24. The forces acting on the particle in the rotating frame are uh, described as number 1 the real force acting, that is F equal to M d2R by dt square fixed. That is the first term on the right-hand side. Second, the centrifugal force arising as a result of rotation of the coordinate system. That is M omega cross omega cross R. That is represented as the last term of equation 24. And the Coriolis force arising as a result of motion of a particle in a rotating system. So that is, 2m omega cross dr by dt rotation. So if particle is moving in a rotating frame of reference, then Coriolis force arises. The first term and the last term is automatic, but the middle term is Coriolis force that is due to the motion of a particle in a rotating system. The centrifugal force and the Coriolis force are arising because the use of known inertial frame of reference. So F is equal to M d2 R by dt square plus known inertial forces. And that gives the F effective or effective force that is represented by equation 25. Now we try to apply the moving coordinate system to our earth and we'll find very interesting phenomenon taking place around us. So the topic is the motion of Earth. Now let us consider two coordinate systems, one at the center of Earth, but fixed in space, neglecting the translational motion of Earth. 
and the other one at the point in the body of Earth, but rotating along with Earth with angular velocity omega. So we consider one fixed at the center of Earth, another is fixed at the same place, but moving along with Earth or uh, rotating along with Earth. The particle of mass m situated on the surface of Earth will be acted upon by the gravitational force F equal to mg. Any particle situated on Earth will be experienced by the gravitational force F equal to m into g or gravitational acceleration. The equation of motion of a particle in fixed system is F d2 m d2 by dr dt square and that is represented f plus mg because mg is a gravitational acceleration term and the equation of motion of a particle in the rotating system can be written as that is m d2 by d2 r by dt square rotation is equal to f plus m g minus omega cross omega cross r minus 2m omega cross dr by dt. That is equation number 27. And the effective gravitational acceleration is, if you look into the middle term of this equation, it is effective ge is equal to g minus omega cross omega cross r, because this effective acceleration, gravitational acceleration is not g, but g minus omega cross omega cross r. And that's represented by equation number 28. And the second term we have already seen, that is the centrifugal acceleration. The effect of centrifugal acceleration. Now we try to explain the equation number 28. The gravitational acceleration is measured at any point will be this effective acceleration and will be less than the acceleration due to the Earth if it were not rotating. So if we consider that Earth is not rotating and the gravitational acceleration is considered, and if we consider that Earth is rotating, then we have to modify it by equation number 28. So that is the effective, the uh, gravitational acceleration when we consider the Earth is rotating. The centrifugal acceleration is always radially outward. The centrifugal acceleration is found to be zero at the poles since omega is parallel to r and it has a maximum value at equator. So the maximum value of centrifugal acceleration at equator can be calculated. The earth rotates in anticlockwise about the north pole with angular velocity omega. So omega is equal to two pi divided by 24 hours into 60 into 60. So if we try to make it into a second, so it becomes 7.29, 10 to the power minus pi radian per second. The radius of earth is 6.4, 10 to the power six meter. So the maximum centrifugal acceleration is omega square r, and that is 3.4, 10 to the power minus two meter per second square. So this is about 0.3% of the gravitational acceleration or gravitational field. This seems to be very small. The reduction taking place is very small, but very important during the launch of spacecraft or rocket for space exploration. So we may consider that the reduction is taking place is 0.3%. For day-to-day -day life, it is not important, but whenever we try to launch a rocket, for a space exploration, it is very important. This value is significant and saves a lot of fuel for launching rockets. Therefore, most of the rocket launching places are nearby equator region, if possible. If it is not possible to locate on the equator, then those are the southern part of the nation. We consider that Sriharikota in India Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, these are situated the southern part of our country, nearby equator region. Cap Canaveral in USA and Kourou in South America, those are nearby, uh, uh, nearby possible region of equator. So those are 
uh, made at the places which are the nearest to the equator region. If the line of effective gravitational acceleration, GE, and G is not the same, the true direction of G is vertical. That is the direction of joining the point under the consideration to the Earth, to the center of Earth. So it is shown that G and GE are not having the same direction. The shape of Earth, any fluid on Earth will come to an equilibrium with its surface perpendicular to the effective acceleration due to Earth. So we know that the effective acceleration due to Earth is not safe on Earth. It changes from the equator to the polar region. And this explains why the Earth has oblate ellipsoid shape with a flatten at the poles. It is not a spherical, but it is an oblate ellipsoid shape, so like an egg. The surface of Earth, neglecting the local irregularities like mountains, it is everywhere perpendicular to the effective acceleration due to Earth. So it is shown over here that the radius of Earth is different. It is 12,756 kilometer, while it is 12,714 kilometers. So it is a oblate abyssoid shape. Now we discuss the Coriolis force on Earth. It is an interesting part. The third term on the right-hand side of equation 27. Let us go back to equation 27. Third term on the right-hand side of equation 27. That is minus 2m omega cross dr by dt. It is the Coriolis force that acts on particle, which is moving with velocity v in rotating system as vr is equal to dr by dt in rotation system on Earth. The direction of Coriolis force will be right angle to the plane formed by vr and omega. So in the right hand side figure is shown. Consider the effect of Coriolis force on a particle situated at a point P and moving with velocity vr in a plane perpendicular to the axis of rotation of Earth having latitude theta. So point P is considered over here. At point P, the particle is situated and the plane is formed, which is shown by a circle at point P. And the angle is made theta, which is also shown. Now, from the figure, it is clear that the unit vectors, which are shown by EY and EX, they form the horizontal plane at point P. But the unit vector EZ is perpendicular, which is shown a perpendicular to that one. Now, from figure, it is clear that, that the component of omega along the vertical direction is omega z ez or ez sin theta. So this is directed upward in the northern hemisphere and downward in the southern hemisphere. We have shown that ez is directed upward in the northern part and will be directed towards downward in the southern hemisphere. Therefore, the path of particle will be deflected towards the right in the northern hemisphere and towards left in the southern hemisphere due to Coriolis acceleration. And that is shown in a figure, in a, another figure in a downward direction, that it is, draft, it is deflected towards right-hand side in the northern hemisphere and opposite in the southern hemisphere. The maximum effect or magnitude of Coriolis acceleration is at the North Pole or at the South Pole of Earth. This is given as follows. It is two omega vr, and it is omega, we have already found, that is 1.5, 10 to the power four, and we have made it double. So it is two omega is equal to 1.5, 10 to the power minus four terms vr, where vr is the velocity of a particle in a horizontal plane. 
considering that one object moving with a velocity one kilometer per second or 3600 kilometer per hour and the magnitude of the Coriolis acceleration is 0.15 meter per second square, which is approximately 0 0.015 of gravitational acceleration. Because here, G is the gravitational acceleration of Earth. So the component of omega along vertical direction in local coordinate system at the equator will be zero. Hence, Coriolis force acting on horizontally particle will be zero in equator. Now, effect of Coriolis force in a flight of missile. Now, here we are trying to see the different example. The small magnitude of Coriolis acceleration plays very important role, though it is a very small. The Coriolis acceleration is considered during the flight of missile when the velocity and time of flight are reasonably large. Because whenever missile is fired, it is moving with very high velocity and it takes reasonably uh, large time to hit the target. If the velocity of the particle is directed towards the north in the northern hemisphere, then the deflection due to the Coriolis force is towards east that we have already seen. So in this uh, figure, x, y, and z directions are shown. And vr is the direction of motion of a particle. And uh, ez omega z shows the uh, z component. And uh, ex is the direction in which the ex x component is there. So omega z, ez cross vr that is in the x direction and the path is deflected and that is shown by red color curve. So red color curve shows the uh, deflection due to the Coriolis acceleration. So the deflection is sufficiently small and the angle of deflection can be obtained as alpha distance travel in time t in the deflected direction divided by distance travel in time t in the direction of projection. So if we know, and if we put the values, it is one half and it is two omega z of vr uh, t square divided by vr t, we are putting the values. And if we simplify it is omega t and it is omega sine theta. So it is represented by equation number 29. On the north pole, uh, theta is 90. And the deflection alpha is due to the Coriolis acceleration is simply the angle of rotation of Earth and time t. So it is having a maximum value. The maximum value of alpha is found at the north or south pole and minimum at the equator. And this is also the reason that the launching pads or launching stations of spacecrafts are situated near equator. If t is equal to 100 second, time t is equal to 100 second, the maximum deflection of missile projected from a point on Earth at equator is alpha equal to seven into 10 to the power minus four radian or 0 0.04 degree angle. This is quite small, but very important in guided missile system. So in the figure we have shown, the deflection is taking place and missile is launched from a moving aircraft and that has to take care of the Coriolis acceleration, deflection taking place due to Coriolis acceleration. The Coriolis force and cyclone. <clears throat> the Coriolis force is important in the formation of cyclone. Whenever a low pressure is formed, a mass of air will rush to this region from all directions. So figure shows the low pressure is created in the middle and the surrounding air is rushing to occupy this low pressure. But due to Coriolis force, it will be deflected to the right hand side in the northern hemisphere. Thus the cyclone wind whirls anticlockwise in the northern hemisphere. So 
the whirling or moving of the cyclone wind, wind is anticlockwise in the northern hemisphere. And it will be uh, opposite thing in the southern hemisphere. So in the figure, it is shown that how the whirling of wind is taking place. And that can be represented by a satellite picture of a, a whirling uh, wind and uh, 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 the cyclone is taking place. And in this picture, the warning is opposite in the northern hemisphere as well as in southern hemisphere in Earth. So these are the two different cyclones taking place. One is above the equator, another is below the equator. Above equator is the northern hemisphere, below equator is the southern hemisphere. The whirling wind directions are different and that is due to the Coriolis force or Coriolis acceleration taking place. So the Coriolis force and Coriolis acceleration is very important on Earth in cyclone as well as uh, in the missile launching and many uh, phenomenon taking place on Earth is affected by this Coriolis acceleration. Though the value is small, but it is effective in certain cases. For further reading, I suggest that classical mechanics by Takwale and Purani. The contributor, the Gaspard de Gustave Coriolis, born in 1792, passed away in 1843, French mathematician, mechanical engineer, and scientist. He contributed to derive the Coriolis force expression. He is known for his work on supplementary forces that are detected in rotating frame of references leading to the Coriolis effect. He was the first to apply the term travel translated as work for the transfer of energy by force acting through a distance. Uh, these are the two beautiful pictures, very important pictures. One is a remarkable photograph, two Nobel laureates together. One is Rabindranath Tagore and another Albert Einstein, picture taken at Einstein's home in Berlin in Germany on July 14, 1930. Another picture is a brilliant Indian scientist. At age of 19 in India, he proved mathematically that white dwarf more massive than 1.4 solar masses will collapse under its own gravity. And the name of brilliant young scientist at the age of 19 who gave this theory was known but as Chandrasekhar. And thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you so much.